watching you. They're watching you. You ever seen uh, Meet the Parents? Ben Stiller. Uh, what's his name? Robert De Niro. Pulling the gloves. And then Ben Stiller goes the wrong way. Anyways, uh, my name is Kurt Gibson. I am from New York City. <clears throat> and I grew up in Connecticut, in Florida. Went to a Jesuit high school. Uh, all boys. And I uh, went to the University of Florida. And uh, after the University of Florida, I got a job with IBM, worked there for two years, and uh, now I'm at uh, PepsiCo. <clears throat> uh, my journey has been quite, quite, um, my journey's been quite interesting. Um, I uh, attended college at Florida, like I said, and towards the end of college, I started having symptoms, uh, blood in the stool, fatigue, things like that. And, you know, I had it checked out, went to the university doctor, and they didn't really diagnose it as anything. They checked for hemorrhoids, other things, and they couldn't find anything. So they're just like, oh, you just get some rest, you'll be fine, you know. Um, and so I said, okay. So anyways, after school, I got a job with IBM, moved to Dallas. Um, and within a month of going there, of, excuse me, of working there, I said to myself that I got to get it checked out because... It was getting, the symptoms were getting much worse, and I was having more issues. And I said, you know what, I got great health insurance now. This is a good time to do it. So I went and got it checked out, and I had a colonoscopy, um, which was an interesting experience. But uh, to say the least, after I came out, the doctor said, hey, we found a uh, polyp, a large polyp. Uh, we couldn't remove it, but we took a sample. And I'm thinking, that doesn't sound too good. Um, but the doctor said not to worry, it didn't, sound, it didn't look like anything bad. I said, okay. So I went home, and two days later I got a call from the doctor, and he said that, uh, I'll never forget, I was at IBM, we were in a training, walked out, took the call, and he said, hey, I uh, just want to give you an update. We uh, took the biopsy of your polyp, and uh, we found some cancer cells. And I was kind of like, okay. And so the doctor was like, yeah, we're going to have to have you come back in, talk about your options, things like that. Um, so I hung up. I was kind of in shock. I really didn't break down crying or anything like that. But, you know, it's kind of wild um, to think because I was 22 at the time, just graduated college. And I knew nothing about cancer. And so anyways, I call my mom first thing, call my dad, call my aunt, call my girlfriend at the time. No answer. Of course, when uh, you need somebody the most, they're never there. But uh, so I went back inside, put on my game face. I was fine. And my cousin Ryan was working for IBM at the time, and he was on Same Time, which is the uh, instant messaging system that that uh, employees uh, talk with. You know, kind of like a chat. So I was like, Hey, I just found out I had cancer. And he's like, Oh, that sucks. <laughs> Because what else did he was, I think, 18 or 19 at the time. What else does an 18 or 19 year old say, right? Um, so I was finally told them, and it's kind of interesting when I talked to my parents finally, they're just kind of like, oh, okay, honey. Well, uh, let's, let's think about this. Well, you know, what did the doctor say? You know, blah, blah, blah. And it was almost like, hello, they told me I have cancer. Like, isn't that bad, you know? Um, but luckily, I had a good family, and they were experienced in cancer. Um, which isn't necessarily a good thing on the outside, but for me, um, going through the process, it was important because they kind of knew how to deal with it. So um, my Uncle Duke, my uh, cousin Ryan, flew down, went to that doctor's appointment with me after the CT scan that I took to check if it was all over my body. Uh, and it was negative, which was great, so that means it was isolated in the uh, colon. Uh, so anyways, the next step was to have surgery. And because I was 22, uh, I needed to um, uh, well, get my colon removed. Um, so I went up to Sloan Kettering, where my aunt was a stay-at-home mother. And uh, she was also taking care of my other aunt, who was going through stage 4 breast cancer. Um, so I went to the doctors there and took a leave of absence from IBM and uh, basically had 90% of my colon removed. So a normal person has got about six feet, and I've got about this much. Um, but uh, you know what? It was a drastic surgery. They did it laparoscopically, so they didn't have to flay me open. Um, they did it laparoscopically, and um, 
uh, took out most of my colon, and so I spent about two, uh, a week in the hospital, which was kind of funny. The Jamaican nurses were rather hilarious because um, I was in such pain when I they wanted me to walk around after the first day of surgery that I didn't even bother buttoning my my gowns. They were like, oh, Kurt, you need to button it up. All the women will not want to go home because you're young and firm. And uh, everybody got a big kick out of that, which was funny. But um, anyway, so I spent a week there. My aunt, again, like I said, was a stay-at-home mom, so she was able to take care of me. And after uh, about two months, went back to Dallas to go through chemotherapy. I uh, so had to do 12 rounds every two weeks. So it was about six months time period. And uh, I just wanted to go back and you know, I was young, I wanted to live my life, so I said, you know what, let me go back and, and you know, just pretend like, uh, you know, nothing's wrong and I can just go through, you know, my normal, my normal life. You know, I didn't want to just be taken out of what I, what I love to do and uh, people my age and things like that. So I went for three months, I wore my uh, chemotherapy to work because it got injected over a two and a half day period. So I went to work with a big tube and things like that, so that was interesting at first, but uh, you know, nobody really cared. Everybody was very sympathetic and, and supportive, uh, which was great. I had even had a, uh, one of my coworkers was a stage four colon cancer patient, Keith Friend, who's still battling currently. And he kind of set up this dinner, uh, dinner shuttle service where each of my training program uh, coworkers, who were about my age, there was about 15 of them, would bring me dinner every Tuesday night. And that was just wonderful because he got pretty much everybody to sign up. And this is very, very, you know, humbling that all these people would do that, you know. I think a lot of people with cancer, uh, excuse me, a lot of, I think a lot of people with uh, friends with cancer, especially young people, don't know what to do. And so when they're given an opportunity to help, they really cherish that opportunity because they don't know how to help any other way. And so it was really great that Keith did that because I think it made a lot of the other people in my class feel good about themselves, that they were, they were helping, helping somebody and making their life easier in some way. So I was really grateful for that. Um, but anyways, after my seventh treatment, um, I got really sick, uh, which was just at the turn of the new year. And so uh, Keith convinced me to go back up to New York, finish my treatments there. And uh, I did, so I was with my aunt and she was really glad to have me back because I think everybody was so stressed that I was going through chemotherapy by myself that they, couldn't, they didn't even want to call me because they were just so saddened by it that I was you know, all by myself in Dallas and, and whatnot. So, and I, I actually rather enjoyed being with my family again because it was very difficult working. I was just tired all the time, felt like I had the flu, um, you know, seven days out of 14. So. So I went back to Connecticut and it was a joy. Got to see my old doctor uh, every two weeks, which was wonderful. Um, and anyway, so after my six months treatment, you know, after about a month of checkups and making sure everything was good, I, it was time to go back. And uh, I'll tell you what, this is a good, great story. Um, the doctor was like, we're gonna need to see you every three months. So I said, wow, that, okay, that's fine. I obviously will do that, but that's really expensive. You know, so, uh, he put me in touch with one of the nurses and she uh, informed me that there's this uh, company, this service called Corporate Angels. She handed me the flyer. I read about it and basically what it does is it flies empty, excuse me, flies patients, uh, cancer patients on the empty seats of corporate jets. And so I called up, you know, after the first three months I called up, I said, hey, I need a flight. You know, I'm living in Dallas, I need to get to New York. So they're like, all right, we'll check into it. And they check into it and about two days before my flight, they call up, and I'm like, hey, Kurt, we have a flight. And I said, oh, great, who's, who's flying? You know, who's, gonna, who's it gonna be? That's flying me up to New York. And they said, I'm sorry, we're not allowed, we're not at liberty to discuss that. So I was like, all right, fine. So I show up, and uh, it's in Addison Airport, which is a beautiful private airport just north of Dallas. And I uh, show up to this hangar, and you know, it's like first class service. I literally walk into the building, they take my suitcase, everything. I'm like, oh, Kurt, hey, how you doing? Kurt Gibson, nice to meet you. Take me out to the back, and uh, right into the, straight into the hangar, there's this plane just waiting for me, and it's like a G5, beautiful plane. And they just walk me right up to it, no security check, no nothing. And I walk in, and there's like the pilot, the captain, and everybody's there, like, oh, hey, come check out the cockpit, the whole deal. And, I'm, and there's like food, and just first class service, unbelievable. I was like, 
is this just for me? They're like, oh no, we've got uh, Mr. Al Carey coming. And I said, who's Al Carey? And they, they say, oh, he's the CEO of Frito-Lay. And I said, oh my gosh, well obviously these corporate jets, who flies on them? High level executives. So anyways, um, I started talking with Al, just he is the most unbelievable man I've ever met. He's just so generous. I can't begin to tell you what he does for other people, but uh, I can tell you, you know, what he did for me. Um, but uh, he just, he was so enlightening, just so positive, and, you know, we hit it off right away. Uh, he went to uh, University of Maryland, ran cross country, I ran cross country. He sent his kids to Jesuit schools. Um, I went to a Jesuit high school. And so we just really, really, um, you know, had a great time talking. And uh, over the next year and a half, I probably caught him half the time. Half the time was either by myself or maybe with somebody else. But uh, the reason was is most of my uh, appointments were on Fridays, and he flew his uh, he flew the private jet to Plano from Connecticut. He lived uh, in in Weston, which is the town next to where my aunt was being uh, or lived at the time. And so he would fly the private jet on Monday morning, fly back Thursday night to be with his family. You know, because when he took the job, he had just moved there and it was like, guys, I'll take this job, but I don't want to uproot my family again. So they said, all right. So anyways, I always flew Thursday night with him for the most part, and so I got to know him, right? Well, fast forward, I was laid off from IBM uh, in a big, big uh, cutback at my center. They basically eliminated the whole, the whole department. And uh, within, actually, ironically enough, Two weeks later, I had a flight to Connecticut, and I was like, oh man, I hope Al's on the flight, And because uh, if he is, I'm definitely going to bring up the job thing, you know? Um, so anyways, I printed out my resume beforehand, the whole deal, and luckily enough, through, <laughs> uh, through God's will, Al was on the flight, and through the first thing he says, he says, hey Kurt, how's your job? And I said, oh, funny enough you should ask, I actually got laid off. And he goes, oh, Kurt, that's terrible. He's here. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, let me know if there's anything you can do. You know, why don't you give me your email and uh, or send me your resume? And I was like, stop right there. I got my resume right here. He's like, oh, great, Kurt. This is awesome. You know, I've got your resume, the whole deal. Um, you know, let me see what I can do. And I was like, great. Sure enough, about two weeks later, get a call from some HR girl. Uh, she calls me, I was like, hey, we want you to come down to Dallas for some interviews. Fly down to Dallas next week, interview with like everybody up through the chain of command of Frito-Lay, and within two days, got a call, I said, hey, we want to hire you down in Houston for the job. And I was so ecstatic, because I had prepared so well, I was like, I'm not going to blow this. This is such an opportunity. And uh, it, it was just such a, my mom was crying, everybody in my family was crying, because, you know, I, I, I think... And I truly believe this, that when one door closes, another one opens up. And, you know, when I got laid off, you know, I ha now have this great opportunity working at Frito-Lay. And it's kind of wild because if I didn't have cancer, I would have never met Al. And I would never have the great job that I have today. I'm just so happy where I am. And, you know, my job, while my job was great at IBM, this is just such a step up you know, in, in all aspects of, of, you know, of me and, and my growth as a person, uh, both professionally, you know, um, and, uh, and personally, that I'm so blessed to, to really have had cancer because I've just been so lucky, feel great, and I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have it. Um, and, you know, I guess the other thing that, uh, Obviously, my family's been so important to me. Um, my Aunt Anna, my Uncle Duke, my mom, uh, I mean, Abuelita Gloria. I mean, these people, they've come to pretty much any appointment they can, um, if not all, and it's just been absolutely wonderful. And, um, you know, the last thing I would like to say is just, you know, I, for me personally, I just want to be able to inspire others. You know, being a young cancer survivor, I think it's, uh, I think it's my duty to really share my story and inspire others. I, uh, I play Ultimate Frisbee, um, and I recently got back from Japan. I was playing at the World Championships for Team USA, and uh, I got invited to play uh, by actually the T 
team who got to represent the U.S., which is always selected from the previous year's national champion because the world championships are every four years and my team from Texas lost in the semifinals to them two years in a row. And so they were selected to represent them, but they're allowed to pick up uh, extra players to boost their roster. And they asked me. And so I was just so blessed and honored because out of the whole country, they picked me. And, you know, I was like, wow, this is such a great opportunity. You know, I really want to, uh, I really want to do great. And, uh, you know, I was just so blessed to have that, that, uh, you know, when I went there, you know, it was great seeing all the people that looked up to us, all the people around the world that, you know, knew about American Frisbee and, and who we are. Um, and so I just was like, wow, you know, people look up to us, young people, and that's just so fulfilling to be able to be a positive, inspirational role model to young people. And uh, probably one of the greatest experiences I've had was, um, I've had a couple of these, but the most recent was a, a young man from Oklahoma on the Frisbee team got diagnosed with my cancer, stage three colon cancer. And he uh, was very scared, you know. Um, excuse me, he got stage, <coughs> excuse me, he had stage two, I had stage three. And so he was just really scared, and I basically told him, I was like, hey, you're going to be fine, you know. Colon cancer caught at a early stage is very, very curable. But, you know, he's young, he didn't know, he didn't have the support system that I had. And, but he knew me through Frisbee, and I was just ecstatic that, wow, I can use this as a platform to help other people, you know? And so it's just a cool, cool thing um, to be able to do. Uh, and I've definitely come a long way from when I was first treated. I mean, I could barely walk around a track. I remember my aunt, like, breaking down in tears because I was, you know, this young athletic, you know, uh, physically active young man and I like took a f halfway around the track and I like was out of breath I like could, I was like collapsed and here are these 55 year old women were just roasting me around the track including one that had, was had stage 4 breast cancer so and now I became a world champion we won the gold medal back in Japan um, about six weeks ago and you know it, to come from not being able to walk you know not a hundred meters to world champion um, it, it, it's just such a great, great feeling, and I'm so happy to have, to have overcome, overcome that disease to, to get where I am now. And uh, but you know what? It's not over, and I've got a lot more to accomplish, a lot more people to inspire, and a lot more things to do to, uh, to really serve the community, serve the world, and really whoever I can, whoever I can inspire. That's really what makes true joy and what makes me happy. So, um, I thank God for for giving me this opportunity to share my, my story and, and uh, my life and my, my experiences with others so they can, they can fulfill theirs. Um, so, anyways, I think that's it. It's been good talking to you, Mr. Camera. I really enjoyed it. You've been a very good listener. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, I think I'm past my 15 minutes because it reset, but uh, go Wreckers. Love stables. Mm -hmm.